So I, I think that the joy comes in the fact that our suffering doesn't have the last word, that there's a meaning, there's a purpose, there's someone carrying that suffering with us. Father Jeffrey Kirby has written an excellent volume called Manual for Suffering, which can shine the light of faith on suffering and help us better understand it as a part of human nature. Here to help us increase our understanding is the author of Manual for Suffering, Father Jeffrey Kirby. It's comforting in a way to know that you can reach for that and read about that suffering and and be realigned in a sense to to that word because it you know understanding or reading about that suffering then pulls you back into a state of of groundedness if I, for lack of a better term but yes um yeah yeah very beautiful passages a lot to meditate on there like it, it, over the lenten period or the time of lent right now there's probably you know you could read it one or two a day kind of thing as a as a mm-hmm as a way, uh, as a practice for this time. But um, I just wanted to go into, like, by the time we get to the third part of the book, I'm so glad you opened the third part of the book with the holy angels, you know, because it seems like their tireless work and their devotion and loving adoration, it almost goes unnoticed now to the everyday Catholic, you know, or that they're just magical beings. But the angels are, you know, an essential part of liturgy and faith. Yes, and it, it seems like the immediacy of uh, modern culture—it's been reduced to something more like a wish instead of something like a more concrete and powerful force for change. Yes. So, can you talk a little, a little bit about that? Yes, I love the angels. I'm, <laughs> I'm so glad you asked. Uh, you know, uh, my parishioners joke because we pray the Angelus prayer, the Guardian Angel prayer, the Saint Michael the Archangel prayer, like. Um, you know, I think when we when we have that perspective of God's divine providence, and, and we realize that we live in a world full of grace, uh, you know, this is not a world of sin. It's a fallen world. There's sin there, but this is a world of grace. This is a God's presence, His life among us. And when we begin to allow ourselves to to have our eyes open to that reality, then suddenly the presence of the angels just they're there. Like we we it'd be like ignoring someone present in a room, like to walk in and greet three people when they're really five and the other two just get neglected. Like, you know, you have to greet the angels and, and, and both recognize their work and ask for their intercession. So uh, I I very much, I love the angels. I always encourage the faithful to to turn to the angels and in spiritual battle to turn to the angels in times of of grief or sorrow, turn to the angels. Oftentimes when there's great tragedy, uh, some years ago, I remember uh, a young man had run away from home and they were very concerned about his well-being and the family was very much distressed. And, you know, certainly we can say pray for this person and 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 certainly, but sometimes we can even direct that prayer in the sense of encouraging the family to, to pray to his guardian angel. Mm-hmm. For his guardian angel is with him wherever he is and wherever he might be, whatever danger he might fi- find himself in the midst of. Pray to his garden angel because the, the angel is with him. Like God has sent that angel, right? And, and at, at the time, that was very comforting for the family. It's very comforting in reality because the angels are with us. So, yeah. so I, I think that, you know, in terms of believers, as, as we speak about the sufferings that we undergo and, and the difficulty, uh, we can't neglect the angels. And I think that if we allow them, the angelic ministry can be very consoling and encouraging I think it's interesting that the three archangels whose names have been revealed to us are about protection, healing, and good news. <laughs> yeah. So I yeah. think God's trying to tell us something, right? And all so their na- I, I love the angels. And all their names end with God. Yes. I-L. L is God. So, I mean, Mikael, Raphael, uh, Gabriel, and yes. they have God within their very name because they yes. are his uh, tireless workers. Yes, yes. And, and I'll say this in terms of, of Michael, um, it's interesting because the devil, the evil one, whose proper name is Lucifer, uh, challenged God and the authority of God. And the very one that God would send to defend his majesty is Michael, so Michael, which means he who is like God. So the one who claimed to be like God and then ultimately to be God himself, Lucifer. 
is vanquished by the one who is like God. And I just think that's very poetic. Yeah. And you know, I think it's even, like, you know. I think it's even more poetic that he sent a very, very lower ranking angel also to uh which would which would be another <laughs> A whole other conversation. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, divine justice, poetic justice. Yes. <laughs> yeah. All of this moves to uh, to prayer, really. And but you know, even in terms of suffering, you, you quote Saint Paul, uh, who's just like a tower uh, when it comes to his writings, and uh, is responsible for so much of uh, the New Testament, his letters. Mm-hmm. But. Can you talk about St. Paul's suffering, but how it ultimately relates to joy? Yes, yes, yes. So I think what's powerful is, of course, you know, Paul is is knocked down and, and, and the Lord speaks to him. I think it's powerful that when the Lord spoke to Paul, he says, why are you persecuting me? So he identifies himself with the persecuted church. It's not my church, but Paul was persecuting him. And of course, this, this radically changes Paul's life. He goes on to Damascus. Uh, God has to send Ananias, another believer, to go and minister to Paul, showing that even the best among us still need to be ministered to. And he goes, and of course, Ananias preaches the gospel to him. Paul accepts baptism. And then what does Paul do? He goes into the desert of Arabia for three years, the equivalent of the time that the apostles spent with the Lord in prayer and reflection. Uh, One tradition says that Paul walked by foot all the way to Mount Sinai, where God revealed himself to Moses and asked that God would reveal himself, that he would understand is the God, is Yahweh, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, the God of Jesus Christ, like is, is Jesus of Nazareth God, right? So you can imagine this, this working out in his own heart for those three years in Arabia, that spiritual suffering, spiritual maturity that comes with that. But then ultimately, as he comes back and begins to then preach the gospel, um, Paul went, went through everything. Read 2 Corinthians. He tells us, I've been shipwrecked. I've been beaten. I've been kicked out. I've been stoned. I've been bitten by a snake. <laughs> you know what I mean? So, and, uh, and yet he would, underwent all that. And through it all, as he tells us in Colossians, uh, we make up for what is lacking in the body of Christ. You know, and what that means is that, you know, not that there's anything lacking in Christ. His sacrifice is completely satisfactory, infinitely uh, fulfilled, uh, you know, the demands of, of, of salvation. But what he's saying is that there's something lacking in us, something lacking in the body of Christ. So we, we make up what is lacking in ourselves by uniting ourselves with Christ. And, and there is the beginning of the joy. Mm. So, yes, like there's the hardship, there's the difficulty, there's the loneliness, loneliness and, and, and so on. And yet through it all to know that I can unite this with Christ and, and be with him in a way that uh, no one else can or I could not otherwise be. And, and to allow this redemptive suffering to work itself out. Uh, I'll say this, that uh, redemptive suffering is a powerful reality in our spiritual tradition that also is greatly neglected. Mm-hmm. And, and I think we need to retrieve it. It's interesting because converts come to the faith yeah. because to the Catholic Church because of our teaching on redemptive suffering. Yeah. You know, the fact that that we can unite ourselves to Christ, that we actually participate in our own redemption. And through this redemptive suffering, we actually participate in the redemption of others. Right. Mm-hmm. So as we as we pray at at, at Mass, uh, may the Lord accept the sacrifice at your hands for the praise and glory of his name for our good and the good of all his holy church. So I think that the joy comes in the fact that our suffering doesn't have the last word, that there's a meaning, there's a purpose, there's someone carrying that suffering with us. You know, so uh, we can imagine our own human life when perhaps a great tragedy has happened and someone was there, maybe not even the person we would have preferred or, or thought, but there was one person there, right? So mm-hmm. we receive a shocking phone call on the death of a loved one and someone happens to be with us. And they share in that suffering at that time. And because of that, they are now forever a friend. There is an intimacy, a closeness that is shared now with that person that makes them a close friend. And if we can imagine that in our human interactions, then in terms of the Lord Jesus, when we suffer, we unite ourselves with him. We are invited to an intimacy and a greater joy than we could have without the suffering in this world. So I think the joy is born uh, by that sense of union and understanding of mission and to be united with Christ. And, 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 and to clarify, when we speak of joy, we're not talking about happy clappy, <laughs> you yeah. know, we're not talking about, you know, euphoria and so on. Like, you know, our tradition says uh, pleasure is in 
uh, the domain uh, of the passions. Uh, happiness is in the domain of virtue. Joy is in the domain of the spirit. You know, it is a gift of the Holy Spirit, almost synonymous with peace. So yeah. we might be, you know, not in the spirit of euphoria or, or jumping for joy and, and backflipping in terms of popular understandings, but a profound existential sense of joy to be united with someone, to know that there's a mission that's being shared, to have that joy, uh, again, that uh, complements peace. And you talk about that in, in the book, the notion of peace in a time of struggle, the importance to hold a peaceful heart when everything may seem to be collapsing around us. And you know, how, can you, how can you send that message, peace in a time of struggle, especially in these times as people are suffering in their own ways, in so many different ways in their own lives? Yes, yes. And, and, and to, to emphasize that, that last point, um, when we speak about suffering, oftentimes what will happen is uh, people will naturally go to physical suffering, mm -hmm. uh, which is understandable because cancer and heart disease and so on, like these are realities. To accompany someone with dementia is, is a reality. Like, but to say that there's also other types of suffering in the manual, I really try to highlight all the different parts of suffering. So physical, emotional, mental, spiritual, relational, you know, all these different parts. So, so to, to broaden the understanding when we speak of, of, you know, suffering and in terms of how to share this message in the midst of a world that has become more and more secular, a world that is suffering, but a world that doesn't appear to be very interested in any contribution that divine wisdom might be able to pose. So the challenge is, is definitely uh, serious. It, it's, uh, we can say in terms of worldly affairs, the odds are against us. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I, I think the best thing we can do is in trying to get a, a hearing is to be a, a witness, mm -hmm. you know, to allow our sufferings uh, to reflect a different way. You know, so I, I saw this firsthand just recently. I was witness to myself and was on the highway and someone cut someone else off. And right. normally that would be some, you know, misunderstood sense of, you know, justifying road rage. But the motorist who was cut off simply backed up and allowed the car in and allowed them to continue to drive. And they went then to the to the right lane as, as I was driving past them. You know, they were just sitting there like they were singing a song or something and stuff. And I, <laughs> I was just so moved by their sense of peace. Right? Yeah. You know, most yeah. people would have been like going crazy and, you know, trying to inflict some type of punishment on the other motorists and so on. I just thought, wow, I, I was witness to by that. You know, mm -hmm. I just thought, you know, that that is uh, the strength that we have as, as believers. Uh, St. John Bosco used to say his greatest weapons were humility uh, and patience. And I think that as, as Christians, if we want to share this message, um, the best thing we do is, is witness it, to, to, to live it. And then as we receive a hearing to begin to speak about uh, why this message is so important. Now, in terms of the household of faith, when we speak to fellow believers, uh, of course, it's easier because yeah. we have an understood understanding of the Lord Jesus and, and we have the scriptures. And I think there we just try to guide the person, uh, much as we've done to this conversation uh, today, to try to guide a person to this greater understanding. Uh, it is harder when the person is in the midst of great suffering. It goes back to the parable of the wise virgins. So to use Lent well, to use um, our own discipleship to prepare. We know that we're going to suffer. It's a fallen world. We know mm -hmm. that there will be a time in which we have to go to the dying process. Like we have to prepare for that. I think the more we prepare for that, the more virtue and grace will be able to work in us. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, you brought back. I'm just. Oh, I'll just have one more question after this one. But you brought back this notion of um, offering up, um, and it's it's something people don't do anymore. But I do. I live in Italy, and I do sometimes hear sort of um, Italians of a certain generation saying, "Oh, I just offer that to Jesus." This, you know, this, this concept of saying this suffering, this pain, whatever this thing is, whatever discomfort it is, I can offer it up. Can you talk about that concept? Yes, just yes. so people and, have it in their, you know, re their arsenal or in their. Yes. Quiver. Yeah. And, and I'll tell you, um, Pope Benedict XVI, when he, you know, when he was a Pope, uh, he wrote a book, uh, an encyclical on hope. 
and 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 in the book in this encyclical he indicates that that exact spiritual act of offering it up he he addresses this as as we're speaking about it and 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 says the church needs to retrieve this yeah. back into the popular understanding of the faithful because it was understood at a time where you know whether it was you know we running late or to something or we stubbed our th- our thumb or we you know tripped or uh, whatever it might be even just the ins and outs the, the the daily just difficulties of a fallen world and there was a very clear understanding to your point of well offer it up like this is something that doesn't have to be wasted right so yeah it's 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 it makes life difficult it might be petty but it causes some some certain hardship but i can offer it up and and not simply in the day to day but then of course in the bigger things i can okay, i can offer this up and and the idea was with this offering it up was a very clear concept and and and, and popular grasp of this redemptive suffering that everything i do i can unite with christ and becomes even greater, right? It can serve even more people, not simply myself, but other people. So the fact that, you know, it can, you know, you know, trip and fall and, 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 you know, okay, it's embarrassing. People are looking at me and I maybe scrape my knees a little bit and I get up and I offer it up. It's like, okay, well, the idea that I could do that and some, okay, that helps my cousin who's away from the faith, or it helps my aunt who's fighting cancer. Um, You know, we, we've kind of lost that. Uh, I think the more we, isolate ourselves and become these sovereign selves, you know, the, the less we yeah. have this communal understanding and the more we become secular, the less we really feel that closeness to Jesus, where I really can unite myself to Christ. And this redemptive suffering can actually help those that I am united to. So uh, I think we used to all have that as Catholics The Mediterranean cultures are, are particularly, mm-hmm. uh, I think, attentive with the communal aspect, mm-hmm. you know, so, uh, the fact that we've lost or are losing it, um, I'm with you. I'm saying, let's get it back. <laughs> yeah, yeah it, <laughs> it, it, also, it also creates a kind of more constant relationship, but more opportunities in a day to be connecting. Um, yeah, for sure. Yeah. Uh, so the, the last part of the book is filled with beautiful prayers. And it's such a gift to have a collection of prayers or litanies, uh, you know, all of these tools, you know, as a good, any good manual should have, you know, um, a whole set of tools. But I, I guess I'll just close with this question. Um, you know, how do you really want people to read and experience this book? Yes, yes. I, I would hope that the first part would walk them through, and, and really this conversation has, has been that kind of walkthrough to understand all the different parts of our theology of suffering and then receive from that theology an invitation to redemptive suffering. And, and that re-understanding of offering it up. And then to see all of these resources, all the holy ones who have suffered in their own different ways, uh, you know, the, the resources we have from divine wisdom, uh, also the, the, you know, the, again, these prayers, litanies, novenas, the specific prayers. And to see in that part of the manual that we really have tried to understand, to, to, to address and to, to show an understanding of all the different parts of um, of suffering. So there's some prayers to say Monica, so, you know, people have loved ones away from the church or someone who has you know, undergone a divorce or uh, someone who's grieving the loss of a loved one. And so we're trying to address with the spiritual treasure of the church, all these different parts. So my hope is that someone would understand this theology of, of, of suffering better, see the invitation of redemptive suffering, and then immediately see the resources from the spiritual treasure of the church to help them. And, and I would encourage, uh, as, as we said uh, so far in this interview, um, believers to use Lent well and, and parts of our discipleship, because it is harder. It, it, it's just, it's harder for ourselves. It's harder as we accompany loved ones to try to address these things while someone's in the midst of great suffering. So to prepare ourselves um, to use the seasons of the church well, um, our discipleship well, I hope this book helps with that. The book is Manual for Suffering, and I've been speaking with Father Jeffrey Kirby. Father Kirby, thank you for your time and for enlightening our audience today. My pleasure. God bless you. Check us out on Apple Podcasts or Spotify, our website, thefocusingway.com.